Good afternoon, everyone. I see that all the board members are uh, here. Uh, my name is Kevin Mullen, chair of the board, and the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report, Susan Barrett. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I wanted to update uh, the schedule uh, for folks, for the board and the public. First, tonight we have a primary care advisory group meeting that starts at 5 p.m. Uh, we've invited the director of healthcare reform at the Agency of Human Services, uh, along with uh, Elena Baraby, and that is Ina Bacchus. She does have a name. Um, <laughs> Along with uh, Elena Baraby, our director of value based payment at the board will be presenting to the primary care advisory group the same presentation that um, they shared uh, with Chair Mullen um, at the general advisory group. And uh, that was, I believe, last week. Um, time flies in a weird way during this <laughs> pandemic. Um, but we did ask our general advisory uh, for uh, advice on informing the next potential model with CMS as co-signatories on that model and uh, really leaders in the design of the model. AHS and the director of healthcare reform um, it, are, are, were part of that uh, presentation to the general advisory and again to the primary care advisory group tonight. Um, We've also um, added to the schedule uh, uh, um, meeting next week, which we will uh, provide to the board our overview of the uh, annual report that we submitted earlier this year to the legislature, and that is the Green Mountain Care Board annual report. Um, last, uh, well, second to last in terms of um, uh, announcements and a last item on the schedule tomorrow morning uh, we will be in the house appropriations committee and we will be discussing our fy 22 uh, green mountain care board budget and then just to remind folks getting back to the um, public comment that same presentation that was presented to the general advisory on public engagement with the all pair model, as well as the one that's going the same presentation that will be shared with the general advisory or the primary care advisory tonight is on our public comment section. And um, you can, if you tap on that section on our website, it will bring you to the slides. And then any of those comments, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that the general public provides. We will also share those with our um, partners at AHS um, as uh, they, as I mentioned, are leading some of uh, most of the work on the design of the model. So I wanted to just remind folks of that and let me see my list. I think that is all I have. So I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, February 10th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, February 10th without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the motion carried unanimously. So this afternoon, um, the, the main agenda is all about learning about the Vermont program for quality and health care and Kathy uh, Fulton and Hillary Wolfley are here to um, basically uh, give everyone an update on all the great work that they're doing at VPQHC. So um, Kathy, whenever you're ready, take it away. OK, terrific. Thank you, Chair Mullen. And on behalf of the entire organization and our board, we want to thank you for this opportunity. I wish we could be together in person. We certainly miss convening face-to-face, uh, -face, but we're very grateful to have this opportunity to walk you through our, our program. And um, Hillary and I will just kind of bounce off one another uh, throughout the presentation. And then we've allotted time for question and answer at the end. So would that be, does that work for you, Chair Mellon? It sounds great. All right, thank you. So we'll we'll jump right in. Um, Hillary, I think is driving the slides. 
Yes, and I just confirmed people can see it, so we're good to go. <laughs> that, that's that's important. <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> so we're very happy to be here this afternoon and um, walk you through. Uh, Hillary, if you move to the next slide, we thought we'd provide an introduction and overview of the organization and then kind of tell you our story through the lens of our funding and contracts then um, bring you up to speed on our current value for our stakeholders. And then as I mentioned, um, follow up with some Q and A. So um, our mission, vision and aims um, reflects, whoops, um, that VPQHC is a 501c3 not-for-profit organized and designated by the Vermont legislature back in 1988. So in 2018, we celebrated our 30th anniversary and um, as a well-established, well-respected um, statewide quality uh, assurance organization. And we were established as an independent non-regulatory peer review committee. Our organization brings the entire spectrum of healthcare voices to focus on quality analysis and improvement our mission is that we improve healthcare quality in Vermont by studying the system and making it better. We serve as a reliable source for data collection and analysis on healthcare quality. We establish appropriate and effective standards and measurement tools for quality of care. We educate healthcare providers on quality improvement and inform consumers and make recommendations to policymakers on issues of healthcare quality. Next slide, Hillary. Our vision is to improve the health status of all Vermonters. And our aims are that are reflect the um, six, six domains of quality of the Institute of Medicine, that care is safe, timely, effective, efficient, equitable, and patient-centered. Whoops, I'm trying to keep up here with the slides. Our statutes um, that define the organization include um, the main statute, which is 9416 that many of you are familiar with, that defines VPQHC as the statewide quality assurance organization, um, defines the bill back formula and the rules that caps our 9416 funding at 75% of our operating budget. We, we are also listed in um, statute 1441, which defines the purpose and um, definitions of a peer review committee. Our stakeholder board is described in statute 1446, which, which designates the Vermont Commissioner of Health as a permanent member of the board with an unlimited term and includes consumer representation on our board of directors. Under 9410, VPQ shall have access to the unified healthcare database for use in looking and understanding and analyzing imp and improving healthcare services in Vermont. And until recently, we were also included in statute 9405, uh, addressing the healthcare resource allocation plan. So next slide, Hillary. Our board of directors is a very um, diverse group of many um, valued stakeholder partners, including representation from the University of Vermont um, Jeffords Institute for Quality. Jason Miner is our chair and treasurer. Mary Kate Molman is our vice chair as the second government position uh, from the Department of Vermont Health Access. Tracy Dolan is the secretary and chair of the project advisory committee and represents the commissioner on our board. Jessa Barnard from the Vermont Medical Society represents providers, as does Todd Bauman from the North, Northwestern Counseling and Support Services Organization. Dylan Burns is the mental health services director at Vermont Care Partners. And Emma Harrigan joins us from VAS, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. David Healy represents the business constituency as a recently retired principal of Stone Environmental. 
And Dr. Kate McIntosh is our insurer representative from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Otella Perry is a director of quality at Mount Escutney Hospital and Health Center and rep also represents the um, participation of the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical, Medical Center. Lila Richardson, um, recently retired from the Vermont Legal Aid Society, is a consumer participant of our board of directors. And Ms. Kevin Veller, um, previously director of outreach and enrollment of healthcare reform at DIVA, is our um, an, an at large member of the board. Our board members participate in a committee structure of th basically three committees that support our activities. The executive committee meets only to um, recruit additional board members and um, fill vacant seats. The finance committee, of course, reviews our um, budget oversight and development and fiscal responsibility. And then the project advisory committee um, provides review and oversight of project developments and work opportunities. So that's our um, structure. And uh, we'll move into uh, an overview of the funding and contracts that define our work and um, revenue opportunities. So we'll, we'll tell our story through the projects and work we deliver. So starting with our biggest um, piece, piece, of our um, piece of our budget, is the um, core funding, our 9416 quality assurance contract that's comprised of um, five substantial areas of uh, deliverables and you know, work focus. Uh, one of the principal areas is the, the Vermont Peer Review Network, which is an online portal that supports our small hospitals to conduct peer review um, cases and information on an as needed basis. And we populate that portal with resources and um, volunteers that lend their expertise to support the small hospitals in instances where additional medical um, external review would be necessary. We also support a, a network of the hospital quality directors that's been meeting now for over six years. Um, this is a, a fantastic opportunity for the quality directors to join together and share discussion, issues, barriers, best practice, and resources um, among each other to um, avoid the pain of um, repeating, um, you know, possibilities of, um, you know, learning the hard way. Uh, this way, from, from network conversations, we can um, share resources that that improve and float all boats higher across the network. We do the same for hospital care management directors in a network that's been meeting now for about two years. And um, again, the same ideas of looking at data and sharing resources, understanding um, comparative performance across specific measures, and just building that network of, um, you know, colleague uh, conversations that can help, um, you know, growing pains through uh, transition and change. And again, each of the networks has, <clears throat> oh, excuse me, um, a portal, a pass protected, password protected portal on our website to exchange documents and resources. We have um, a very large bucket of um, labeled as technical assistance. That includes the items listed here on the screen, um, our support to the National Health Safety Network uh, for our hospitals to submit their surgical site infection and healthcare acquired infection data uh, for reporting in Act 53's Vermont Hospital Report Card. But in addition to those very specific um, tasks, the technical assistance is a very large bucket of everything from responses to legislative inquiries, orienting new quality directors, and you know, just sharing information on um, new opportunities, job openings, and answering the phone for any kind of um, issue or question or um, assistance that could be needed through many of our networks, including the Green Mountain Care Board. <laughs> 
Then our largest piece of work under the 9416 contract currently is the support of the statewide telehealth work group. And we'll provide um, a lot more detail on the group's activities since its inception. Um, but I'd also like to mention that the um, statewide telehealth work group was in was um, functioning and in position prior to the um, public health emergency presented by the COVID you know, pandemic. And we were very fortunate to have this structure in place prior to uh, the onset of the, the COVID emergency. And um, the support of the statewide telehealth group was included in Green Mountain Care Board's Rural Health Services Task Force report uh, to the legislature that was presented, I believe, about a year ago. So uh, we were very happy to have that structure in place and look forward to um, ongoing collaboration for sure. Um, another piece of information. Um, yep, yeah, next slide, Hillary. Thank you. Um, this is a, a segment of our budget and fiscal documents that is annually shared with um, the Department of Financial Regulation that provides the fiscal oversight of the 9416 contract. So this provides a very um, rolled up version of what the 9416 um, uh, bill back funding is allocated to, and then um, assurance that this, uh, that our, uh, the 9416 component is within the 75% cap. And you can see those figures at the bottom of the slide that at the point that our budget was presented to the board this past spring, we had a very, um, one of the, the smallest budget in um, my tenure with the organization um, uh, that was very conservative at the time, but within the 75% cap, as you see um, at the budget presentation, it was 70% due to the allocations that we've received for the um, payment uh, paycheck protection program and the coronavirus funding relief uh, allocations for uh, another contract that we'll talk about in a minute, we were able to reduce the um, percentage of the 9416 uh, contract down to 25% at this uh, recent presentation to our board of directors. So we're very pleased with um, our fiscal performance. Um, unfortunately, it's one-time funding, but we were able to literally double our budget um, as a result of it. And uh, we would like to, to produce more budgets that look like this one, but all to, also to give you the reassurance that uh, DFR uh, provides some oversight uh, through the review of this document on an uh, annual basis. Uh, Hillary, the next slide gives you an idea of the um, detail that is presented on a quarterly basis to the Vermont Department of Health that provides us with um, what I call the programmatic oversight and um, our progress towards the performance measures and deliverables as stated in the project. This is a very large, um, a very large document with many, many lines of detail. And we review this with Kelly Doherty at VDH on a quarterly basis. So next slide, Hillary. This is a screenshot of um, the homepage of our website. And previously we had uh, produced an annual report of the details of the information that's being presented here today, but also um, you know, analysis and information about progress and um, improvements. That was a very large production that we conducted in-house and um, was a paper, uh, largely a paper process. We had struck on a very good um, kind of a graphic presentation of information that was accessible to um, many stakeholders and uh, different partnerships. 
but we found that we've um, outgrown the need for a, an annual paper report. And now we really plow all that effort and energy into uh, the production of a website that is really a living, breathing um, uh, resource of information and um, current topic uh, links and of uh, available resources. So we've really focused on um, keeping this current and um, as, a, as a resource to all of our partners. So moving on to some of the other contracts that we um, deliver on, we are a subcontractor to the Vermont Department of Health, and we've been um, performing on this subcontract since um, 2011. So we've been conduct collecting 10 years of uh, serious reportable events, uh, reviewing uh, the details of the events and the causal analysis and corrective action plans. This contract includes on-site visits to hospitals once every three years. And now the two ambulatory surgery centers here in Vermont are included in our patient safety surveillance and improvement system. And we produce an annual report summarizing these activities that's part of the Act 53 hospital report card and is posted on the VDH website. This work is so important because in the, in the statistic on the right-hand side, nearly 14% of US hospitalized Medicare beneficiaries experience adverse events resulting in prolonged hospital stays, permanent harm and life-threatening intervention, or in some cases, it, it, it events lead to death. 44% of those events are considered preventable and the cost associated with these preventable adverse events is over $118 million. So it's really a very important statement on the business case for quality and safety. We have on the next slide, Hillary. We provide you with um, a list. This, these are the category areas of the um, reportable event types. The link at the top um, is a link directly to the National Quality Forum and a listing of the um, events themselves, but they are categorized in these seven areas of surgical or invasive procedure events, product or device events, patient protection events, care management events, environmental events, radiologic events, and potential criminal events. So the way our performance looks here in Vermont, Hillary, if you wanna jump to the next slide. Over the course of these 10 years, VPQHC has reviewed 436 serious reportable events, which is just a, sub, a, a very um, substantial and uh, valuable uh, um, process. And we can take the information learned from these reviews, share those through our communication networks, so that again, the lessons learned are passed along to um, disseminate best practice and eliminate um, uh, the possibilities or, or the, um, li the likelihood of those events occurring somewhere else. So that's a, a great number and it has been a great effort over these 10 years. The next slide shows you where those events um, fall um, in, in terms of those seven categories. The largest um, area is care management events that uh, compiles uh, you know, events like pressure ulcers, falls, medication errors, um, labor and delivery events. And then that category is followed um, by the much smaller surgical events category. Hillary, next slide. So the, this is the um, reporting system um, since its inception back originally in 2008. And you see a dramatic increase in reporting following calendar year 2011, 
when the National Equality Forum uh, dramatically increased the um, number of, uh, the, expanded the list of the serious reportable events. And as a result of that, VPQHC embarked on an extensive education program with hospitals that increased um, the hospital event report submission. And through that educational process, we really developed um, terrific working relationships with our hospital partners um, that in, instilled the confidence in um, this reporting system and VPQHC as a resource um, to continue improving and reporting on these serious reportable events. So next slide. There we go. Um, this is a screenshot of the annual summary of the patient safety event reporting system in Vermont. This is the 2019 calendar year report that's currently posted on the VDH website. The link is provided at the top of the slide. Uh, this will be updated with the 2020 um, analysis once we've completed that later this spring. But this is this information in this report is available to the to the public through the VDH website. And if we go to the next slide, Hillary, we also conduct a very similar process with the Vermont Department of Corrections to conduct independent case reviews of serious safety events occurring for incarcerated individuals. We conduct the, a similar uh, review of the causal analysis and corrective action plans to, in, that, to ensure a thorough and credible analysis was conducted internally and to um, you know, where we see the opportunity to um, challenge uh, uh, the, the partners in um, Department of Corrections to look at from a systems perspective. Um, both in terms of the patient safety and the de Department of Corrections reviews. These are non-punitive non approaches, but we want to look at systems level fixes to ensure that this type of event won't happen again on the next shift or to the next patient or next individual that um, encounters the health system. So um, we, in both cases, also look to review um, that uh, uh, compliance with, um, in, the, in the case of the Department of Corrections, the National Commission of Correction Health Standards are um, adhered to, and similarly in our um, hospital reviews as well. We look to have a consistent um, level of uh, clinical, clinical standards uh, reviewed at, in, in both situations. So next, next project and review, uh, next slide, Hillary. And um, maybe what I'll do is uh, transfer uh, this description over to Hillary. She's been working on this for many, many years with our good partners at the State Office of Rural Health and can um, speak with uh, great expertise to the, to the next contract and program. Sure. So uh, this slide is about um, highlights our work under the Medi Medicare Beneficiary Quality Improvement Project. As Kathy mentioned, VPQ is a subcontractor um, to the De Vermont Department of Health for this work. Um, it's done under the Rural Hospital Flexibility Grant or the FLEX program. Um, the purpose of the program is to improve the quality of care in critical access hospitals by increasing um, the healthcare quality data reporting and driving improvement projects based on the data. This program allows individual hospitals to look at their own data, measure their outcomes against other critical access mm -hmm. hospitals and partner with other hospitals in the state around quality improvement initiatives to improve outcomes and provide the highest quality of care to each and every one of their patients. In Vermont, um, I'm happy to report that the majority of critical access hospitals have historically participated in this program and it's entire voluntary. So it, it just shows their commitment to, to this work. Um, through the VPQ's role, we provide educational programs um, to support improve it, improvement initiatives and disseminate resources to the MBQIP network. 
And we also provide comparative performance data to the hospitals. On the next slide, which I'll, um, this includes a list of the measures that are under the NBQIP program. These measures have been deemed by a national committee to be rural relevant and to be able to withstand small, vo small volumes. And what's so important about this measure set is that the majority of these measures align with other quality reporting programs. And alignment and coordination are, are so key for not overwhelming hospitals and to be able to, to, be able to allow hospitals the capacity to work on fo focused improvement um, where it's needed the most. So VPQHC provides comparative data um, to the hospitals through this program, as mentioned, um, on a quarterly basis. Um, we feed back the data on all of the measures that the hospitals are reporting under the NBQIP program. In the following slides, you'll see a few snapshots of some of the um, reports that we provide the hospitals with, um, and it's all just um, examples. It's not actual data from the hospitals. Um, but the first is a comparative dashboard. Um, this is a snapshot in time of um, the hospital's performance and shows all of the critical access hospitals in Vermont and how they stand in relation to one another and in relation to national benchmarks. On this, um, in, on this dashboard, green meets or green indicates they are uh, meeting or exceeding the national benchmark. Yellow is within 2% um, below the national benchmark, and red is greater than 2% below the national be benchmark. So here the hospitals can see how they're performing in relation to their national peers, but also their peers here in Vermont. And having something like this really supports networking among the hospitals. If there's a hospital that's doing really well on a measure, the, uh, their colleagues, colleagues can reach out to um, for to ask how they got there and um, to see if they ha have any policies, procedures, and tools that, that can be shared. And this is all in a non-punitive, improvement-focused um, manner. And the next couple of slides just show some other examples of how we um, prepare the data for the hospitals. Um, this shows uh, individual hospitals' performance over time um, on communication about medicines and shows the benchmark as the national average. Sometimes we change that based on the hospital's preference to the 90th percentile. Um, what's nice about the NBQIP program, though, is that there are also critical access hospital-specific benchmarks, which are really important because we know that critical access hospitals um, face are unique to larger hospitals in many ways. Um, and presenting the data this way can help hospitals hone in on where they want to focus. And um, also just, um, you know, in more, uh, in several instances, shows just shows them how well they're performing on so many of these measures. So a couple of other slides uh, just demonstrating a few other metrics under this program. <coughs> All right, back to you, Kathy. Okay. So on this slide, um, you may think that we've just ordered up a, a bowl of alphabet soup with NQIC, HQIC, and EQIC. And um, one of the other um, focus areas under our 9416 contract is called QI coordination. And it, it's an important activity that VPQHC participates in along with other quality partners, um, the Blueprint for Health, One Care Vermont, that kind of um, helps us to align and communicate and kind of figure out, um, keep, keep everything straight under these um, uh, alphabet soup categories. So to walk through this um, fairly quickly, and quick is the new, the, the um, revised um, CMS quality improvement uh, program that uh, had traditionally had directed improvement efforts to Medicare beneficiaries across the country. It is now called the National Quality Improvement and Innovation Contract. And under this contract, 58 primes across the country are awarded task orders to administer um, different activities, uh, again, that focus on improvement of quality uh, activities for um, Medicare beneficiaries. 
The HQIC is the Hospital Quality Improvement Contract and Task Order 3. And currently, VPQHC and VAS are partners along with six other Eastern states in the Eastern States Quality Improvement Collaborative, or EQIC, that is focused on the Task Order 3 activities of reducing harm and improving, improving patient safety and hospital quality improvements. This program um, requires significant data submission on standardized metrics that will then aggregate performance data and produce benchmarks for the recruited hospitals. We are very fortunate that VITAL is getting um, involved and engaged with this work and uh, is developing um, some, some resource to uh, provide a comprehensive data submission uh, for the data element requirements on behalf of the Vermont hospitals that will virtually eliminate the reporting burden that our hospitals would, would have to feel through this, through this effort, through the Task Order 3 initiative. And you know, this is one of the envisioned purposes of the Health Information Exchange, and we're just so thrilled um, that VITAL is listening to us and hearing and moving forward with this possibility. And to date, we have seven Vermont hospitals recruited and continue to have um, additional conversations, hoping to recruit a few more. So Hillary, on the next slide, um, what we have is a graphic of everything that I just explained. We tried, we've tried to um, you know, go with the, the philosophy that a picture uh, paints a picture of a thousand words. Everything I just explained is kind of represented on this graphic that's available on our website. Um, it's a it's a little um, unusual to try to uh, communicate the and the federal initiatives, but we've done our uh, best job to try to capture the information and keep everyone informed. On the next slide is um, just some some uh, a brief uh, picture of the clinical focus areas that will be addressed by the Eastern Quality Improvement Collaborative. Um, many of these are very important to our hospitals. We have some opportunities for improvement and we have some best practice to contribute to the larger um, collaborative initiatives. But this, through this work, we'll be able to deliver some very valuable resources um, to, our, to our local hospitals and um, you know, continue the work that uh, weaves so, so nicely in with um, all the work that our hospitals do all day, every day in the areas of patient safety and harm reduction. So we're very excited about moving forward with this work and our, and our expanded partnerships in the region. So on the next slide, I'm gonna ask Hillary to provide you with an overview of, of this topic. Again, uh, an area she's very familiar with. I do also want to just mention that we have also partnered with the um, for the eQuick work with the VAS um, Network Services Organization, which is helping immensely with um, the data lift for the hospitals as well. Um, so moving on to this slide, though. Um, another project VPQ carries out is the Independent Provider Training Project which aims to improve the quality of suicide-specific treatment in Vermont. This work is supported through independent donor funding. Again, the data is what drove us to focus on this topic. As we know, in Vermont, the rate of suicide is higher than average and growing faster than the national average. We also try to do our part and row in the same direction in recognizing that this is an area of focus for the all-payer model. Um, this work is how VPQHC um, saw it could work towards moving the needle on this metric in a way that's complementary and coordinated with, with what else, it, everything else that's going on in the state. There are three main pillars um, to this project. The first is a survey of independent mental health providers in Vermont. In 2019, we surveyed 1,940 independent mental health providers to assess their comfort and comp competence in assessing and treating patients with suicidal thoughts. You can see the questions that are included in this survey um, on the slide. 
Um, the second pillar is training. We are able to offer um, those providers that want to improve their skills in this area training at a significantly reduced cost. We partner with an organization to provide what is called CAMS training, which stands for collaborative assessment of and collaborative the collaborative assess collaborative assessment and management of suicidality. CAMS is an evidence-based therapeutic framework, which is internationally recognized as a top-tier suicide-specific assessment and treatment intervention. And the third, peer, uh, third pillar includes work that VPQHC has done to put together a list of independent mental health providers that have suicide-specific training. This list can be used to support appropriate transitions of care. For example, we provide it to the care management directors at the hospital so they can use it when needed when they're looking to discharge patients. It's also um, available on our website. And this, um, this work is uh, led by Mary McQuiggan, our QI specialist at the organization, and she's really done some amazing things um, under this program. All right, let's see. Okay, back to you, Kathy. Okay. On the next slide, um, and this may be familiar to you, we just recently concluded the analysis ready data set report. And we're just so happy to collaborate with the A team at the Green Mountain Care Board. And while this content was maybe not necessarily in our wheelhouse with VPQ as HC as the experts. We subcontracted with Steve Capel and David Healy, um, and uh, certainly the process of, of gathering the information and producing this report um, it is a, a, an area of competency for our organization. We conducted a review of the previous efforts and conducted stakeholder interviews uh, with you know, valued partners to understand um, how the VCURES data set could be um, redesigned to be um, very useful and, and valuable for um, analysis for organizations just like VPQHC, where we don't have um, a, a computer program or PhD on site to be able to um, navigate the complexities of a data set like VCURES, but that would be able to um, give us some basic access and uh, and move forward in our continuing search to conduct um, data analysis to uh, understand and improve the uh, healthcare delivery system here in Vermont. So it was uh, a great opportunity for us to collaborate with Green Mountain Care Board. Then as we go into the next slide, this was our most recent um, and just recently concluded activity that was funded through the coronavirus relief funding um, and allocation from the legislature for our Connectivity Cares package. And back in October, um, Hillary, you can move to the next slide. Uh, we sent out um, eligibility survey and recruitment flyer information. And this survey was posted for nine days back in October. And only in nine, you know, in the period of these nine days that the survey was available, there was an identified need for 1,900 digital devices and over 500 Wi-Fi boosters for organizations serving vulnerable Vermonters. Um, we can only imagine, you know, what could happen if this um, survey were available for a longer period of time. But as a as a, uh, our reach, um, Hillary, you can move to the next slide. We were able to partner with 58 diverse organizations across the state, located in all 14 counties, that served um, you know, such diverse groups as uh, assisted living and low income housing, FQHCs homeless shelters, hospitals, private practices, mental health counseling centers, and so many others. Um, this program was, was just fantastic um, in, in distributing um, apparently much needed uh, equipment to, to be able to maintain um, you know, uh, care and treatment through the pandemic health emergency. Um, Hillary, if you move to the next slides. 
Um, we have a series of photographs of um, the equipment being being uh, received and cataloged and then uh, re reassembled into our literally the connectivity care package and then um, the distribution process uh, through uh, you know, using uh, Green Mountain Messenger to distribute uh, all the equipment across the state. And then um, we've been a, it's just so blessed with some of the testimonials and feedback that we've received from these you know, new partners and new relationships that we've been able to form up and maybe just take a moment to read some of these. You know, thank you for sending along the iPads and what great instructions. I love them already and have two guests already signed up for meetings this week. You know, we, we know in one of the organizations, I believe it was one of the SASH um, sites, they received equipment on a Monday and had appointments scheduled for two days later on Wednesday. So this was um, this was a, a, a very beneficial um, uh, program and uh, beneficial to uh, you know Vermonters uh, that were uh, impacted by the health the public health emergency. And then I think this is my favorite uh, the testimonial. Uh, this is so wonderful. This is going to change my life. So again, we just appreciated all the great feedback that um, we received. And the impact and reach of this program um, is through um, a, a final survey, a site, evaluation, a site evaluation surveys that provided estimates for the use of this equipment that each, each device could potentially reach um, seven people. Uh, some are being given directly to patients, others are being shared in congregate living settings, and then others are set up as a loaner program that get checked out and for use for a designated period of time and then come back and are um, redistributed to another, uh, another user and benefit. So those are our current major funding programs. Um, what I'd like to do now is transition to some of the activities we've undertaken and how we feel this delivers value for our stakeholders. Uh, we have some several you know, recent and um, you know, very uh, valuable to us um, examples of this work and our connections. So Hillary, you're the um, most familiar with the recent audio only telemedicine clinical quality speaker series and report. So if you'd like to dive into those details, that would be terrific. Sure, so um, here we just highlighted a project that re VPQHC recently um, completed alongside its statewide telehealth work group. Um, some of you may know that the Vermont legislature um, asked the Department of Financial Regulation to convene a work group to determine whether parity reimbursement should continue beyond the public health emergency for audio only telemedicine. And as DFR uh, began meeting with its work group, um, it became clear that there were a couple of different conversations happening. One was reimbursement focused and one was um, quality focused. So DFR approached um, VPQHC to see if we could lead the um, healthcare quality discussion with its statewide telehealth work group, um, which led us to this work. Uh, VPQHC was happy to take, take it up. Um, we lined up a series of uh, local, regional, and national subject matter experts in healthcare quality and telehealth to come and speak to the work group. And the product of this work was a report out on um, our process and recommendations and along with the background of how we arrived, um, arrived mm -hmm. at this project. Um, in, I wanna make clear that audio only telemedicine refers to synchronous telephone based visits with a provider that replace an equivalent in-person visit. I will give you a link to the report and I've copied our recommendations um, in the slides that um, after this one, but I, I won't go in too much into detail because I know time is um, tight. But I will say that consensus was um, uh, there was a recognition that audio only telemedicine is not a silver 
bullet for achieving equitable access to health care, but that it's a step in the right direction under the current um, conditions of our health care delivery system and fee for service payment payments and a, a, in a world where the digital divide exists. And the workgroup consensus was that we need to use every tool available to us to ensure that patients get a measure of care when they need it and where they need it. Um, but as we heard from many of the subject matter experts, this is new-ish territory um, in the sense that an audio only visit would replace an in-person visit, not just providing some, you know, uh, touching base with quickly with your provider over the phone. Mm -hmm. um, and the group agreed that there were some measures that we could take to ensure that patient safety and quality were safeguarded. So um, those are outlined in the, the um, these slides um, and you can refer to them if you're interested but I, I will say I really liked one of the quotes of or one of what one of our subject matter experts Judd Hollander of Thomas Jefferson uh, University said quality care is quality care whether it's delivered on the first floor of a building or the fifth so um, just to keep that in mind um, when thinking about telehealth and, and healthcare quality. And I will just say quickly, our recommendation centered on healthcare quality measurement, monitoring and evaluation, patient engagement and empowerment, and provider education and training. So we'll, moving through, um, we'll try to get through our last couple slides fairly quickly here so that there's plenty of time for Q&A. Um, this is another example of a statewide initiative that brought together many community partners. Um, looking at the, uh, the Vermont performance on the follow-up for hospitalization HEDIS measure, um, this is a report that VPQ produced as a result of a statewide um, you know, meeting that we, we facilitated on the continuity of care following hospitalization for mental health to help improve the transition and, and warm handoff from the inpatient setting to continuing care and treatment based in the community. So many good um, uh, policy objectives and um, uh, opportunities uh, were captured in the brainstorming of uh, the uh, activity. And this uh, resource is also available on our website as well. And the next slide, provides you with a little more detail of the um, partnership. And um, Hillary, if you wanna give a quick overview of this, cause this is very important. Um, sure, so under the statewide telehealth work group, um, at the start of the pandemic, we started offering twice weekly telehealth open office hours and trainings in partnership with the Northeast Telehealth Resource Center and Bi-State Primary Care Association. Mm -hmm. I've included the um, topics that we've addressed on the next slide, um, but, this data point just shows the majority of providers were not providing telehealth services prior to the pandemic and everybody had to um, pivot quite quickly overnight to set up services so patients could maintain access to their care. Um, and here are the themes <laughs> that we've addressed. Most have um, centered on workflow development and analysis, data collection, patient engagement, clinical best practices, and so on. I do want to emphasize here Todd Young, the Network Director of Telehealth Services, and Sarah Kessler, Telehealth Program Strategist at the University of Vermont Health Network, have been invaluable to this work and have lent their time and expertise for free to really help um, providers across the state set up their telehealth services. So let's see what's next. Oh. This is another topic that's near, uh, um, uh, dear to our hearts at VPQ, again, driven by the data as we've seen that communities of color have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic and that the time is right to really be focusing on and drive um, health equity initiatives. We offered a training back in the summer and we have more health equity trainings uh, coming up and there's been sin significant interest um, in this work. And to close out, uh, you know, another topic that is important to VPQHC is um, women in healthcare leadership. Nationally, women only hold 13% uh, of CEO positions in hospitals and 30% of C-suite positions, despite making up 80% of the buying decisions in healthcare 
65% of healthcare workers being women, healthcare workers being women. So we convened a panel at the VAS annual meeting to hear from Vermont women healthcare leaders about their journeys, experiences, and lessons learned. Um, we also had great partnership from Tiffany Bloomley from Change the Story Vermont, who mm -hmm. led a facilitated discussion. It was a truly inspirational couple of hours, and we're very thankful to the Hospital Association for their support uh, and encouragement of this session and important conversation. So hopefully everybody's still awake. I think that was our last slide. Um, it was indeed a very robust presentation. <laughs> I'm tired just going through the, but I'll pass it to you. So to, to wrap up with some final thoughts, um, this is our VPQHC team. We have 7.5 FTEs that do the lift on all the work that you just heard about. Um, there's only two, two faces missing from this uh, collage, but we work extremely well as a very dedicated group of professionals. And I think I'll speak for the entire group and say, we really don't work every day. We bring our passion and so it doesn't feel like work. We are um, putting our best efforts towards um, activities that we believe, uh, believe in and it doesn't feel like work to us. Probably the best compliment ever came from Dr. George Blyke, the recently retired chief quality and value officer at Dartmouth Hitchcock, who stated as he was um, retiring uh, as our board chair, that VPQHC punches above its weight class. And um, I just, I have to agree, everyone works so hard. And uh, just a final thought that uh, the lessons we've learned on our journey are that partnership, collaboration, local knowledge and relationships are key and alignment and coordination of activities are essential. And um, just you know, a final thought that as um, Green Mountain Care Board um, is moving towards the hospital budget season, we'd love to collaborate and support, provide support to develop a dashboard of key metrics to monitor as hospitals transition into value-based payment um, arrangements. And we can help develop a process for the quality portion of the hospital budget reviews that can connect the community health needs assessment results to action plans and make those findings you know, come alive. And then finally, we want to um, increase our communications with the Green Mountain Care Board about hospital quality initiatives that happen all day, every day throughout our Vermont hospitals. So I'm gonna leave you with that as a final thought and then, um, Chair Mullen, we're happy to entertain questions. Well, thank you so much, Kathy and Hillary. We'll start with the uh, board and I'll go in alphabetical order. So I'll call on board member Holmes first. Jessica. Great. Uh, well, thank you both for coming. I so appreciate the time that you took to pull together this uh, presentation. It's clear there's a lot of great work here. Maybe I should say lots of great passion here uh, <laughs> in what you do. And I, and I look forward to the, the area, the final slide of the areas for um, collaboration and synergies, really helpful. Uh, I, I do have a couple of questions. Um, and it's so, you know, I've been on the board for six years and you, you know, we've interacted sporadically over the years, but we've never had a comprehensive, full blown uh, presentation. So I learned a lot today about what you do. So I really appreciated that. One of the things that struck me is it seems as if most of the assessment and the measurement of quality in terms of the reporting that's done, the site visits that are done are really done at hospitals. And I was wondering what role uh, VPQ plays in the rest of the care continuum in terms of measuring, assessing site visits for quality that's delivered elsewhere. Sure, um, Jessica, you know, as um, some of our um, presentations showed, we have a, a partnership with Department of Corrections and we've, oh, we've, right. done, yeah. that, we've sure. done that work for a number of- Along the lines of, uh, well, go ahead, right, yeah. Yep. And um, nursing homes, long-term care, um, home care have a system of supports that uh, we connect to periodically but they're you know, well supported um, in their efforts to improve quality initi initiatives. We are always a resource to help develop 
um, talent and uh, you know share educational opportunities uh, with with um, you know the other components of the continuum. But specifically with skilled nursing facilities, nursing homes, um, the more regional QIO organization has great programs and supports. And, and that's where we also do that QI coordination work. But we also um, participate in the Blueprint Executive Committee meetings and have routine communications with One Care Vermont. So we work across the, the continuum we uh, would also love to um, uh, develop more partnerships and relationships with Vermont care partners. And I think um, you know, our work with the independent mental health providers is a, a step in that direction for sure. Got it. Okay, that's helpful. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, we've heard from hospitals and other, you know, as it relates to um, the all pair model or one care or other types of um, programs um, and initiatives that they get a lot of data. They have so much data sent to them and there's a lot of reporting that goes in the other direction, but there's a lot of data and analysis that gets sent down to the hospitals. And one of the things I've heard from some of the you know, hospital leadership is that so much data, it's not a shortage of data, it's a shortage of resources to be able to implement the changes that would be required. And I'm wondering, have, have you, how do you think about that? You know, it's, um, it's one thing to, to showcase some of the areas where there might be opportunity, but then what's the next step and how do you, um, you know, think about working with the hospitals to make the changes that are needed to get those, you know, quality metrics going in the better direction, going in the green, out of the red? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. And I absolutely agree. There's so much data, but there's um, kind of a shortage of information. And I think that's where an organization like VPQHC can help in that process of taking the data and conducting the analysis, you know, presenting it in a comparative format so that um, the hospital or any other organization can then like see themselves in the pack, like where they fall a, against a peer group and against a benchmark, and then have that meaningful discussion about, well, what specifically are your areas for, for improvement and just help convert that pile of data into meaningful information. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine that's where the peer network helps a bit as well. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the um, statutory requirements of the HRAP is for us to be thinking about identifying and quantifying overutilization and underutilization, and both obviously have huge impacts on the quality of care delivered. So I'm wondering, in your, you know, with your expertise or your um, experience, how would you help us, or how, what direction might you send us in to think about how would you measure overutilization and underutilization as we need to? in uh, our HRAP analysis. I, I think that's that's kind of what they call the, the Goldilocks uh, position, you know, finding the exact right number um, for volume or utilization. And um, there's often pairings of metrics that um, the over under can be balanced and always, always having the, um, what I would call the mindful discussion of what unintended consequences could be from um, too much um, restriction on certain resources or um, you know capacities, so that there so that there is not an unintended unintended consequence of you know driving further for care and driving right past a facility that um, would be able to deliver the right care. I think also understanding um, ambulatory sensitive conditions and potentially preventable admissions, but, but really understanding um, so that those un unintended consequences can be avoided. Well, if you have a list of those metrics, or <laughs> please send them our way. That would be really helpful. I mean, we've thought about, you know, and I think we're using some of the ambulatory care sensitive, um, you know, uh, conditions and the um, preventable admissions, but uh, Overutilization that would be helpful too. I know you know there's some areas like choosing wisely has some has some metrics, but I would love you know if you've thought about this 
to send it our way. My last question is, I thought that was an interesting statistic about the 14% of Medicare beneficiaries who experience adverse events. And then if you do the deeper dive, it's about 6% of overall Medicare beneficiaries who have something that's preventable. I'm wondering, has VPQ HC done any analysis of Vermont? What is the similar metric or proportion in Vermont of Medicare beneficiaries who experience adverse events or preventable adverse events? Do we know that? Um, I, I think we can um, get some of that data through our QIO partners. And yes, we would love to start diving into that. And I think those are some of the areas in the um, hospital quality improvement contract that we'll be able to uh, produce that information and have some meaningful conversations. Would that go in the dashboard that you were suggesting? It absolutely could. That sounds great. Okay, those are my well, questions. Thank you so very, very much. I appreciated it. Thank you for the opportunity, Jessica. Thanks, Jess. Now we'll move to Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Hillary, for uh, giving us an update. It was really interesting to hear how things have evolved on the telehealth front for me since yeah. uh, I was an area I looked at in a lot of depth with the Rural Health Services Task Force. Um, my question was around the Medicare uh, quality improvement initiatives and whether um, you've thought about or looked at already um, how those measures may be consistent with or not, if they're not, um, the all-pair model metrics. Obviously, you know, certainly at the all-pair model level, we were shooting to have a, a fewer number of high of, of measures, and there's certainly more in the Medicare space um, that's included in your slides. But I was just curious about your thoughts on that. So, so for me, Robin, and that's a great question, absolutely. Um, and I and I think about that a lot um, because the MB Quip measures are really tailored to be rural relevant, and they focus on those processes that the small hospitals um, have to fulfill, and how how um, you know the the metrics that are are big sized for community sized and academic medical centers just simply don't fit. Um, so, you know, population based measures also for an ACO organization, um, you know, are also probably not the right fit for the critical access hospitals. But um, how they can all play their role in a, a systemic view of um, system wide care delivery and how is everybody executing their piece of the process? I think that's a good way to look at how the metrics are used and kind of how they're put together to, prov to provide an overall system performance picture. Thank you. Sure. Um, I was also curious, uh, one area that we frequently hear, as I'm sure uh, you do as well, is related to the administrative burden of uh, measurement and data collection. And I think there have been some great strides in terms of using vital or other entities to help with that uh, administrative burden. Um, do you think that we as a state have more work to do in terms of aligning metrics? Uh, we did a lot of work uh, prior to the all pair model around trying to ensure that um, we were streamlining as much as possible um, collectively as a state, but certainly there are some metrics that are more federally driven, and yeah. I'm wondering if there might be any opportunities for further streamlining, even if it involves federal partners, for, for example, perhaps when we uh, are talking about the next uh, iteration of an all-pair model agreement. I, um, Robin, to be totally honest, I always see that there's opportunity for further alignment, alignment and harmonizations across programs. Um, you know where that's possible. You know to the greatest extent possible. I think Vermont is certainly moving in that direction and has achieved uh, um, some good progress there. Um, there's there's always more to be gained with further alignment. Great. Well, thank you very much. Those were my couple of questions. Thank you, Robin. Tom? 
Well, thank you for this. It's uh, it's overwhelming almost listening to the <laughs> breadth of your activities, not only in the moment, but over time. Um, I have some vague recollection, you know, when uh, when uh, <clears throat> the uh, VPQHC was was formed in the early 90s. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, as a kind of a fallout, I think, from the healthcare single payer fights, you know, back in the early 90s. But uh, so, you know, my questions would kind of follow in line with, you know, Robin's uh, uh, your presentation and Jess's as well. Um, the, um, I guess one question I would have is uh, over the short term, over the next two years, um, what, what would you like to see the Green Mountain Care Board do better uh, from a, a data-driven perspective? What do you think we can do better and what would you like to what what are the two or three things that you would like to see us do better so um i would love to see uh v cures be able to um you know, step up uh you know almost nationally as a really um um Excellent, you know, top-notch all-payer claims database, and I think the Green Mountain Care Board is um, well along that path to um, to move that forward. I look really, really look forward to the inter integration of clinical data into Vital, and any role that Green Mountain Care Board can um, take in supporting that both policy and um, procedural process towards that, um, that would be another step in the right direction. I think um, in terms of a longer term vision, I would just love um, organizations like VPQHC and our hospital organizations uh, and others, you know, Vermont Care Partners, um, Healthcare Advocates Office, for all of us be able you know, to, to go to the data well, dip our bucket in, easily get the data that we need to, to do analysis and convert that to information that then in, you know, informs policy improvement initiatives and resource allocation. That, that would be fantastic. It certainly would. And, and it leads into yeah. my second question that, you know, as I was listening to you, I was thinking of all the other data sources that you know, I've encountered in, in my three year journey here. And you think about our own uh, A team, which is great. Um, yep. The healthcare advocate has uh, um, uh, some folks that like to crunch numbers. Uh, DIVA has its its own uh, uh, data, the Department of Health as well. You folks, VAS, insurers, vital, and there are so many of them. And so the point that you were making near the end about alignment and coordination of activities is so important because oh, sifting yeah. through it all um, is and and finding the true story or the true stories is uh, very difficult. Um, so I'm wondering mm -hmm. if if uh, as uh, someone familiar with all all these entities, um, whether or not you folks would be willing to try to write, you know, a four or five page paper um, about how we might get get these bumper cars from less bumping and more <laughs> um, using the data to address, to define problems and to address problems. Because I think there's a lot of data out there. And just like you just said, you know, people would be helpful to be able to say, here's the dashboard, here's my bucket, this is what I need, and um, help answer questions in a timely manner rather than, you know, at least in my experience, sometimes hunting and pecking around you know, and I'm not sure that I'm I'm uh, cherry picking or hunting and pecking, you know, sometimes. So, um, you know, it's uh, it would just be helpful because there are there is all this data out there. Every one of these entities does a lot of number crunching and there's some on the spot coordinations where people need help and, and one entity helps another. But it would be nice to have somebody, I think, kind of think through how do you glue these together and truly achieve the alignment and, the, and coordination that I think Jess's uh, um, uh, questions and Robin's questions, uh, you know, we're, we're searching for. Well, Tom, I think we'd be very willing to take that on. 
but um, judging by our uh, presentation this afternoon, it may be kind of hard for us to keep that to a four or five page paper, but we would definitely um, welcome the opportunity to really, as you described, think through how to glue that all together. Well, that would be a, a, a wonderful result and uh, hopefully would send the snowball rolling down the hill. Um, <laughs> So that was my, I mean, I, I, my, my observations were right in line with Robin's and uh, Jess's and in terms of that, uh, of that regard and just my own personal experience, you know, trying to find uh, helpful information that is well grounded and foundational to make, to help shape decisions that are the best they can be. Thank you. Oh, very happy. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Maureen? Uh, first, thank you very much for the presentation. It was, you know, really informative, and uh, you know, I, I think you should come before the Green Mountain Care Board more <laughs> and, and work <laughs> Happy with us. To. But, um, I, I definitely think, you know, the punch above your weight quote was a good one um, because you guys do produce a lot of information. Um, most of the questions I, I had were asked, but I have a couple on when you looked at your um, P and L. I always have to go to the financials, but when you when you looked at your P and L and um, your revised 21 where your expenses are cut in half so they were 726 going to 367 for personnel expenses is that where you put the ppp loan or i just wondered how you got it, yes and um you know we we retracted uh to a certain extent um you know over this period but we had some um, program uh, deliverables in our contracts that we were not able to execute on because we couldn't conduct site visits on the hospital campuses. Okay. So that, that impacted two of our contracts. Okay. But did you put the PPP in the revenue line? I would have put the PPP in the revenue line. It doesn't matter, but your expenses were cut. I didn't know if you were offsetting that. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to double check with my um, director of finance, and we've only just today gotten approval of our PPP application. Okay. So, so we've been absolutely thrilled with that information that, um, you know, really substantially helps the organization. Um, but yeah, we jumped through all those flaming hoops and, um, you know, we we did not um you know we would not put that in a um, um inappropriate category for sure right. okay yeah. okay yeah. and um you know i definitely think the you know for the hospital budgets and being able to produce dashboards yeah. particularly for the quality pieces would be very helpful and yeah. when you look at you know the the information you put together on the preventable events and um you know the 118 million what time period was that quantity for so you had 118 million was what you quoted for preventable adverse events in the hospitals so that that's a national statistic that came out of the center for medicare and medicaid services i'd have to go back to the source to to double check the um the time frame for that for those specific numbers. Okay. I'll, I'll, yeah, bringing those to our hospitals, right, and, and the charts yeah. that you do, and and trying to track and quantify if that's and, and I know you did do some charts on that on the number of incidences, but if that's increasing, decreasing, you know how we can learn from the data that you have and translate that to you know, better quality, lower cost healthcare, you know, would be really helpful. Um, so, so that was one area. Um, other than that, uh, thank you. It was, it was a very informative presentation. And Terrific, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So great. At this point in time, I'm going to open it up for public comment or questions. Is Are there members of the public who wish to comment on today's presentation? Is there any member of the public who wishes to comment on today's presentation? Seeing and hearing none, Kathy Hillary, it's uh, 
been a, a fascinating uh, afternoon. Um, you guys are doing a lot and uh, keep punching above that weight class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, will do. Thank you so much, Chairman. You're welcome. Board members, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. Thank nice. you, Kathy. Bye. Thank you, Hillary. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.